Have you ever imagined yourself being swept into an adventurous and thrilling journey amidst the skies, where every decision could impact an entire nation? Join us for an electrifying cinematic experience with Air Force One, a renowned Hollywood film revolving around the theme of terrorism. If you're prepared, then the flight will begin boarding right now. Let's fasten your seatbelts and experience it together. The movie was set in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. General Ivan Rodik became a dictator in Kazakhstan. He plotted to overthrow the Russian government led by President Stalika Petrov, causing the world situation to become extremely tense. To prevent Rodik, a joint military campaign between the US and Russia, conducted a raid on the presidential palace of Kazakhstan. A paratrooper team stormed the presidential palace, eliminating the guard perimeter, capturing Rodik, the dictator of an illegal terrorist regime in Kazakhstan that had taken possession of former Soviet Union nuclear weapons, and brought him to Moscow for trial. Three weeks later, a diplomatic reception was held in Moscow to celebrate the successful capture of the Kazakh dictator, attended by the President of the United States, James Marshall. Here, the President expressed regret for not acting sooner to prevent the atrocities committed by Rodik. He also pledged that his administration would take a firmer stance against terrorist regimes. In the face of the losses and suffering of thousands of people worldwide, brutality and terrorism are not political tools. The president declared to the world that the United States would no longer negotiate with terrorists or overlook interventions in dictatorial regimes. Afterward, President Marshall was escorted aboard Air Force One to return to the United States, accompanied by First Lady Grace his daughter Alice, and several members of the cabinet as well as his advisors. The aircraft, bearing the name United States of America, appeared amidst triumphant music, accompanied by strict military security to ensure the president's safety. At this point, a group of journalists also joined the flight carrying the president of the United States, with the participation of Igor Korsunov. Korsunov and the press team were cleared through security checkpoints, as their names were on the Air Force One staff list. Melanie Mitchell, the press secretary, had instructed Agor and the press team to visit the president's aircraft for a tour and to review the schedule together. As soon as he boarded the plane, President Marshall reviewed the schedule with pilot Danny and Gibbs. Just before the plane took off, the president was resting and relaxing with his family in a special compartment, when he was notified of an unusual meeting on board. And as the plane took off, everything was just beginning. As Air Force One soared through the sky, Gibbs, the undercover agent, began to act. He shot and killed three agents and secretly unlocked the weapons cabinet, setting off smoke bombs, signaling Korshunov and his accomplices to grab weapons. Upon detecting smoke in the cabin, flight attendants and passengers began to panic. After fully arming themselves, the terrorists began their assault on the plane. An emergency alarm was raised. However, the terrorists opened fire, killing several agents, advisors, and capturing others as hostages, including First Lady Grace and President James Marshall's daughter. Meanwhile, President Marshall was escorted by two agents to the escape pod compartment. Despite being pursued by Korshunov's people, the escape pod still had enough time to launch. As the attackers initiated a battle, the pilots attempted to land the plane at Ramstein Air B, Osa in Germany. While the plane was preparing for emergency landing, a squadron of F-15 fighter jets was dispatched to escort the aircraft. However, Korshunov did not want the plane to land because if it did, their plans would be ruined. He and an accomplice stormed the cockpit, using explosives to break in because the door was locked. After gaining access to the cockpit, Korshunov ordered the pilot and co-pilot to take off again. But when the two pilots refused to comply, he brutally killed them. Then, Korshunov's accomplice took control of the aircraft, causing it to take off again. To the surprise of security forces and military personnel below the base, Korshunov intended to take the aircraft to an airbase in Kazakhstan, where the commander was also loyal to General Rodik. The aircraft was now completely under the control of the terrorists. At this point, other passengers had been captured by the hijackers and taken hostage. Believing that the president had escaped, the hijackers planned to use his wife and daughter as leverage for negotiation purposes. Korshunov gathers the rest of the passengers into the conference room and contacts the White House Situation Room, where he speaks to Vice President Catherine Bennett. He demands that they arrange for Roddick's release in exchange for the President's family. Until their demands to release Roddick are met, the terrorists threaten to execute hostages every half hour. Meanwhile, the U.S. military had located the escape pod but found it empty. President Marshall, a retired military pilot, a Vietnam War veteran, and a Medal of Honor recipient, stayed aboard the plane to rescue the hostages. 
Korsunov and his accomplices were unaware that President Marshall was still hiding in the cargo hold instead of using the escape pod, and he quietly observed the terrorists. After playing cat and mouse with one of the terrorists, Marshall engaged in a physical altercation and subdued the individual. Just as he retrieved the key and prepared to unlock the hostage holding room, the terrorist regained consciousness and shot at him. Marshall was forced to use his firearm to eliminate the terrorist. With the situation becoming more intense, Korsunov's group began to spread out to hunt, but the president quickly escaped from the cargo hold through a secret tunnel. At the White House, the vice president continued to contact Moscow about the plan to release the terrorist Rodik, but Moscow refused to agree. After 30 minutes, when it was time to execute the first hostage, Korsunov, upon receiving word from the White House that Rodik could not be released, immediately killed a national security advisor, First Lady Grace and daughter Alice were taken to the cockpit as separate hostages, meanwhile, in the cargo hold of the plane. He immediately contacted the White House via satellite phone. Just as the call was made, he was spotted by one of the terrorists. The resourceful president quickly concealed the phone in his pocket and engaged in conversation with the terrorist to covertly relay information to the White House and Vice President Bennett. He silently ordered the F-15 fighter jets to launch missiles at the aircraft, causing the hijackers to lose control. Seizing the opportunity, Marshall subdued the terrorist who was watching him and escaped. While still connected to the White House via phone, President Marshall strategized and instructed Bennett not to negotiate with the terrorists. As his comrades continued to be taken out, Korsunov retaliated by executing Press Secretary Melanie Mitchell in front of Marshall's family and over the intercom system to taunt the president, whom he still believed to be a mere agent. Despite the agony of witnessing his close aide's death, President Marshall managed to contact the ground to initiate the dumping of Air Force One's fuel reserves. And he succeeded. This forced Korsunov to demand mid-air refueling after Marshall dumped the fuel and ensured the safety of the hostages. Marshall sent a fax to the White House, instructing the refueling plane to force the plane to descend to 12,000 feet, so the hostages could parachute safely without suffering from low oxygen levels. Exactly as planned, with the assistance of the crew, most of the hostages escaped via parachute, until one of Korsunov's men discovered them. The ensuing chaos caused depressurization in the parachute bay, and several people were sucked out of the plane without parachutes. President Marshall was fortunate to be partially sucked out but managed to cling to the aircraft and be pulled back in. This also disrupted the refueling process, causing the fuel reserve of the refueling plane to ignite and explode in mid-air. Korsunov takes Marshall hostage, along with Major Caldwell, Gibbs, and Chief of Staff Lloyd Shepard and threatens to kill Alice unless he agrees to call Russian President Petrov and demand Roddick's release. As Roddick prepares to leave prison, Marshall breaks free and kills the last two of Korsunov's men. Korsunov drags Grace down to the cargo bay, where he throws all the remaining parachutes overboard, except for the one he is wearing. In the ensuing fight, Marshall wraps a cord around Korsunov's neck, says get off my plane, and opens the parachute, which breaks Korsunov's neck from his head and floats away off the plane. Get off my plane. With all of the hijackers dead and regaining control of the plane, Marshall halts the release of Roddick, who is fatally shot as he tries to escape. Marshall regains control of the plane's controls, turning it toward D the nearest airbase. Meanwhile, back at the White House, Bennett discovers six Kazakh MiG-29 fighter planes piloted by Roddick loyalists in pursuit and alerts Marshall. A squadron of US F-15s arrives to provide support and engage the Mijis. During the dogfight, one pilot sacrifices himself to intercept a missile aimed at Air Force One. However, the resulting explosion severely damages Air Force One, rendering it unable to land safely and causing fuel leakage. Marshall directs Air Force One towards safer airspace. A MC-130 Hercules aircraft from the Air Force Rescue Squadron is tasked with rescuing Marshall, and other passengers from Air Force One before it crashes into the water. After Marshall's family and Chief of Staff Lloyd Shepard are evacuated, Marshall, Gibbs, and Major Caldwell remain on the plane. With the last engine failing and the final rescuer informing them that they can only evacuate one more person, Caldwell advises Marshall to go, but Gibbs reveals that he aided the terrorists in hijacking Air Force One kills Major Caldwell in a U.S. Air Force pair rescue, and attempts to save himself on the last remaining zipline. Marshall overpowers Gibbs before Marshall disconnects the zipline from the plane, ensuring his own safety. As Air Force One plunges into the Caspian Sea, splitting into two and killing Gibbs, Marshall is safely rescued, embraced by his family amidst the celebration of his survival. So, that's the end for today. Thanks for watching and see you again in the next videos. Peace.